right, good afternoon. Uh, it's one o'clock and this is the time and the place for the hearing regarding the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program or ELAP issuance of a citation for penalties in the amount of $137,841.60 for Western Analytical Laboratories or WAL failure to comply with the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Act or ELA and the applicable regulations and denial of Western Analytical Laboratories applications for renewal of accreditation. The citation and denial were issued on May 9th, 2019, and this petition was filed June 10th, 2019, including a request for stay. I am Sean McGuire, board member of the State Water Resources Control Board, and I will be assisted by staff counsel Kim Niemeyer and Andrew Hamilton, environmental scientist. We also have other staff assisting us today. The next few minutes will be spent going over some general information about how, how the hearing will proceed. First, a few words about safety. Please look around now and identify the exits closest to you. In the event of a fire alarm, we are required to evacuate this room immediately. Please take your valuables with you, take the stairs, not the elevators, down to the first floor and exit the building. Our relocation site is across the street uh, in Cesar Chavez Park. If you cannot use the stairs, State Water Board staff will direct you to a protective area inside a stairwell. These hearings are being held in accordance with the notice of public hearing that was sent out to the parties on September 10th, 2019. The purpose of these hearings is to afford the parties to these proceedings an opportunity to present relevant oral testimony and other evidence which address the following noticed key issues. Number one, did Wall's creation of reports for Skyline with coliform sampling results violate the ELA? Two, was Wall operating a satellite laboratory at Skyline? Three, was the issuance of a citation to Wall for civil liability in the amount of $137,841.60 appropriate? Four, was the denial of Wall's application for renewal accreditation appropriate? And five, has Wall implemented corrective actions to address the problems? Several temporary stays were issued, and on July 25th, 2019, the State Water Board Executive Officer Eileen Sobeck issued a letter continuing Wall's interim accreditation until the hearing has been held, and the State Water Board has issued a decision. In addition to the evidence and arguments submitted with the citation, denial letter, and petition, the parties also submitted additional evidence, including witness statements and legal arguments on October 14, 2019. Rebuttal arguments and evidence were also submitted on November 4th, 2019. In addition, there was a request on November 7th, 2019 for Robert Brownwood to be added to the prosecution team, which was granted. Although Mr. Brownwood may provide argument and general policy statements, he will not be able to testify at the hearing. A request was also made by the Coalition for Accredited Laboratories that the hearing be webcast and that they will be able to provide a policy statement. Both requests were also granted, as it is the State Water Board's general practice to webcast hearings and allow for the introduction of policy statements. That statement has been forwarded to both parties. And this morning, Another policy statement was received from the American Council of Independent Laboratories, and both parties received a copy of that as well. The general order in which parties will present their direct testimony and or cross-examination today is first, the prosecution team will go, and second, uh, Western Analytical Laboratory. As noted, there were two policy statements submitted. Before the evidentiary portion of the hearing, we will hear from any other speakers who are not one of the designated parties, but who wish to make a non-evidentiary policy statement. The designated parties will have an opportunity to make an opening statement and may include any policy type statements during their opening statements. Is there anyone here who is not with the designated parties and who wishes to make a non-evidentiary policy statement? If so, please stand up and raise your hand so we can see you. Okay. Um, 
we will note for the record that no one here today has indicated that they wish to make a non-evidentiary policy statement. After my announcements, we will move on to the evidentiary portion of the hearing for presentation of evidence and related cross-examination by the parties. After appearances of the parties, at the beginning of each case in chief, the party may make an opening statement. Opening statements should briefly summarize a party's position and if applicable, what the party's evidence is to establish, is intended to establish. After a party's opening statement is presented, we will hear oral testimony from the party's witnesses. Before testifying, witnesses should identify their written testimony as their own and affirm that it is true and correct. Witnesses may summarize the key points in their written testimony and do not need to read their written testimony into the record. Direct testimony of each party's witnesses will be followed by cross-examination by the other party. Uh, I may have additional questions along with other members of the team advising me. The hearing team's questions and responses to those questions will not count against each party's time which currently is one hour each. Redirect testimony and recross examination limited to the scope of the redirect testimony may be permitted. After all cases in chief are completed, the parties may present rebuttal evidence to refute evidence presented in the cases in chief. Parties are encouraged to be efficient in presenting their cases and their cross examination. Except where I approve a variation, we will follow the procedure set forth in the board's regulations and in the hearing notice. Each party has been given one hour for presentation of their opening statement, case in chief, redirect, rebuttal, closing argument, and cross-examination and recross-examination of the other party's witnesses. You do not need to exhaust the maximum time allotted, and you are encouraged to be efficient in your presentation. Additional time may be allowed upon a showing of good cause. All parties should take care to meet these time limits. At least one party has indicated today that they will be objecting to hearsay evidence, which is fine. Note, however, that I will not be ruling on each objection, but rather be taking these notes, uh, objections under submission. And with that, are there any questions regarding the order of proceeding that I have just outlined? May I be heard? Yes. Can I yes, please. Good afternoon, William Carter on behalf of Western. Um, I had a procedural question and or request. Since this is an evidentiary hearing, I believe any testimonial witnesses should be excluded during the examination of the other witnesses so that there's not uh, a preview of what the cross-examination questions would be. That's pretty standard in an evidentiary fact-finding hearing. So I would request to the extent uh, a witness is testifying, the other witnesses would have to be outside. That, that would be my first request. And with you have additional requests? Yes. Okay. And with respect um, to uh, the documents that were submitted by the uh, prosecution team, none of them were under penalty of perjury. None of them are declarations, as opposed to Mr. Conti, uh, who you'll hear from, all of his were submitted under penalty of perjury. So we believe those should all be submitted. We are gonna be objecting to any testimony uh, from uh, the witnesses that are based on, with, without having heard their oral testimony, we object to their written statements as coming in as evidence. They should have to testify under oath. Thank you. Thank you, give me one moment. Good afternoon, board member, board member McGuire. Um, with regard to the exclusion of the witnesses, uh, first, that's not called for by the hearing procedures. Second, I think it's common practice for the board to take panel cross-examination and panel testimony. And so I think that would be a deviation from the standard board practice. Um, and so we object to that request. We don't think that that makes, um, that that's consistent with the state board practice to date. Um, with regard to the submission of uh, the written testimony by the staff that was not a declaration. All of those witnesses here are available 
uh, to be cross-examined, and they're all going to take the oath when it's administered. Um, so that that testimony is going to be uh, um, under the burden of under penalty of perjury. And so I don't think that that's actually uh, a fees a, a basis for an objection. And so we don't we don't think that that's reasonable. If I may respond. This is as the court, or rather as the hearing officer would understand, this is highly unusual. This is the first of its kind. So we are, and we are dealing with some very serious allegations being made by the prosecution team. And I believe this is that sensitive, given the life of this company, that we should have the opportunity to question people without other people getting a preview of what their colleagues may say in response. We think it's that serious. And we think that's a due process argument that is central to this case. Give me one moment to confer with counsel. I'm going to deny both uh, requests at this time. This is an administrative hearing falling under the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, and I agree uh, with the prosecution team's um, statement about um, normal practices being followed here. Um, also, the, the prosecution team's witnesses will be sworn in and all of their testimony under cross-examination um, will be under oath. And so I'm gonna um, allow the hearing to proceed as originally intended. Were there any other requests? Just uh, respectfully, it may be useful to resolve uh, the order of cross-examination um, in light of uh, Western Analytical Laboratory's position. Um, I believe a normal procedure for cross-examination at one of these administrative hearings would be as a panel uh, to administer, the, to have the question responded to by the staff person uh, who's most able to respond. That may be not, it sounds like that wouldn't be Western's preference. So I think we should resolve whether or not it's a panel cross-examination at this time or not. I don't think the prosecution team objects necessarily to individual cross-examinations. Um, however, in light of the need for efficiency in, in our experience, the, the panel questioning is usually a little bit faster. Do you have a pre Okay, I, I will allow for individual cross-examination at this time, and I'll note that it may affect the, the one-hour time limit constraints given the need for individual cross-examination. So we'll take that into consideration if we come up against the time thresholds. That said, I don't anticipate today's hearing to extend beyond 5 p.m., and if needed, we will find natural breaking points to take breaks along the way. Um, I don't believe, are there, I have a question here, are there any other procedural issues that need to be addressed? I think we just addressed them. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you. Before we begin with the evidentiary portion of this hearing, oh, we don't have this, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm here, right? Yeah. All right. I apologize. Now I will invite appearances by the parties who are participating in the evidentiary portion of the hearing. Will those parties making an appearance please come up to the microphone when we're ready and make sure it is on and state your name, address, and whom you represent so that the court reporter can enter this information into the record. If you have not already provided the court reporter with your business card or name in writing, you may hand it to staff when you come to the microphone and they will pass it to the court reporter. Um, first, we'll have the, the prosecution team, Nicholas Knight. My name is Nicholas Knight. I am a senior staff counsel with the Office of Enforcement and I represent the prosecution team. My address for the purposes of this appearance is 801 K Street on the 23rd floor, Sacramento, California, 95814. 
in, in Western Analytical Laboratory, Mr. William Carter. Uh, yes, William Carter on behalf of Western Analytical Laboratory. At, I am with Music, Peeler, and Garrett. I'm at the one Wilshire building, 624 South Grand Avenue, Los Angeles, California, 90017. Thank you. We will now hear the prosecutor. Sorry, Mr. McGuire. I'm oh, also I'm co counsel with Mr. Carter. Stephen Eli, E L I E, Music Peeler and Garrett, also same address. Thank you. We will now hear the prosecution team's opening statement and direct testimonies from Jacob, Jacob Ohaka, um, Naeem Ahmad, and Chris Hand, followed by any cross examination. Redirect and recross examination may then be permitted. Respectfully, are we going to administer the oath to the witnesses? Yep. Um, will the witnesses testifying please stand and raise your right hands? Do you swear? Oh, sorry. Please go. Just the witnesses. Just for everyone's information, Dr. Alan LaBelle is here pursuant to our subpoena. He is also a witness. you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth? If so, answer yes, I do. Thank you. You may be seated. And counsel, you may proceed. Thank you. In the interest of time, the prosecution team is going to forego its opening statement, and we're going to move directly into our case in chief with uh, the testimony of Jacob Oaxaca. Good afternoon, board member McGuire and members of the advisory team. My name is Jacob Oaxaca, and I'm the supervisor for ELAP's Program Development, Research, and Enforcement Unit. As the supervisor, I oversee a multidisciplinary team of professional scientists who work on regulatory initiatives, technical inquiries, and enforcement investigations. My written witness statement in this case is provided as Prosecution Team Exhibit 1. To my left is Naeem Ahmad, Staff Environmental Scientist. Mr. Ahmad is an EPA-approved laboratory certification officer and is the lead investigator in this matter before us. To his left is Christopher Hand, Staff Environmental Scientist. Mr. Hand is also an EPA-approved laboratory certification officer. Mr. Hand assisted in obtaining and reviewing records, as well as leading efforts in the calculation of the citation. Mr. Ahmad and Mr. Han's written witness statements in this case are provided as prosecution team exhibit two and three, respectively. I will be giving the presentation on the case in chief, but all three of us are available for cross-examination. Today we are here to resolve this important enforcement matter for ELAP. It is important because every day, California's regulatory agencies, including the State Water Board and Regional Water Boards, rely on, rely on environmental testing data that they expect to be scientifically valid and of a known and documented quality. Simply put, scientifically valid data is the foundation for public health and environmental policy. When the data is not scientifically valid and of a known and documented quality, the validity of the data is jeopardized. It destroys the foundations for the decisions that are made regarding public health and the environment. Without valid data, regulators cannot make good decisions or create effective policy. ELAP plays an important role by ensuring that laboratories that have been accredited by ELAP are competent and capable of producing data that meets the needs of the state's regulatory programs. When laboratories do not meet the requirements set out in the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Act or the regulations set out in Title 22 of the California Code of Regulations, ELAP has the authority to deny accreditation and impose a civil liability. 
In the present case, ELAB denied Western Analytical Laboratory's application for renewal accreditation and issued the laboratory a citation for fabricating data, misrepresenting material facts in reports submitted to the San Diego Water Board, and establishing a non-ELAP accredited auxiliary laboratory, all of which are violations of the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Act. This presentation will demonstrate that ELAP's actions were supported by the evidence and were appropriate under the circumstances. I will begin with an introduction of the relevant entities, describe the origins of the case, and summarize investigations and findings conducted by the San Diego Water Board and ELAP. I will then respond to the five key issues identified by the State Water Board and its advisory team by addressing the alleged violations of the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Act. I will show that ELAP's actions were appropriate and that Western Analytical Laboratory's corrective actions have not addressed the principal underlying violations. I will then conclude with what ELAB believes to be the appropriate and recommended board decision. There are five primary entities involved in this case. We have the California Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program, or ELAP, Western Analytical Laboratories, or WAL, Skyline Ranch Country Club, or Skyline, EnviroTreat, and the San Diego Regional Water Quality Control Board, or the San Diego Water Board. ELAP is the laboratory accreditation program established under California's Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Act to provide oversight of analytical testing services that environmental laboratories provide. The program ensures that the accredited laboratory community can comply with an accreditation standard and demonstrate the competency and capability to perform analysis for regulatory compliance and generate data of a known and documented quality. The data that is generated by ELAP accredited laboratories is then used to make decisions which impact public health and the environment. Western Analytical Laboratories is an ELAP accredited environmental testing laboratory located in Chino, California. It has been privately owned by Gregory Conti since 2015. Mr. Conti is also the designated laboratory director on file since 2005. The laboratory employs approximately 20 staff and provides services for nearly 2,000 clients. For a period of 10 years, WAL provided laboratory reports for Skyline's wastewater treatment plant. Skyline Ranch Country Club is a mobile home park and golf course located in Valley Center, California. The golf course is irrigated with recycled water that is treated, for, treated at an on-site wastewater treatment facility operated by Skyline. The facility is permitted as a waste discharger by the San Diego Water Board under order R92005-0258 and addenda. The permit requires Skyline to test daily for total coliforms and quarterly for inorganic constituents. The testing is required to be performed by an ELAP accredited laboratory. For a period of 10 years, WAL provided the laboratory reports for Skyline. EnviroTreat is an environmental consulting firm operated by Dr. Alain LaBelle. EnviroTreat provides compliance assistance with the San Diego Water Board's order by preparing quarterly monitoring reports, or QMRs, on behalf of Skyline. The QMRs include the laboratory reports provided by WAL. This slide represents the relationship among the primary entities. ELAP has regulatory oversight over WAL, who provides services to Skyline. The San Diego Water Board has regulatory oversight over Skyline, who contracts with EnviroTreat to assist with compliance.
The origin of this case stems from a complaint to the San Diego Water Board by a resident of Skyline. In the complaint, the resident claimed she was getting sick from recycled water being sprayed onto her home. As a result of the complaint, the San Diego Water Board conducted an inspection at Skyline on April 30th, 2018. During the inspection, San Diego Water Board staff identified red flags that led to a referral to ELAP. These red flags included possible sample hold time exceedances and improper procedures for total coliform sampling and analysis. The San Diego Water Board went on to issue Skyline a notice of violation, which included failure to comply with data, re data requirements of the permit and improper procedures for total coliform sampling and analysis. After review of documentation provided by the inspection staff from the San Diego Water Board, ELAP determined that further investigation of wall was warranted as there did appear to be issues with, this, with sample hold time exceedance, along with concerns that Wall was performing testing using standard method 9221B, a method the laboratory was not accredited for. So on June 20th, 2018, ELAP staff performed an unannounced inspection at Wall. Upon conclusion of the on-site inspection, ELAP requested that Wall provide any and all documentation and records related to total coliform analysis conducted for Skyline. The information Mr. Conti provided was inadequate and less than what ELAP would expect from an accredited laboratory. In particular, there was no chain of custody or records documenting sample prep or, re or records documenting laboratory activities such as sample receipt, sample preparation, media origin or expiration, QC protocols and assessment, or records of demonstration of capability for each analyst. Furthermore, the laboratory reports Mr. Conti provided were missing the signature of Wall's laboratory director. ELAP was, however, able to obtain the final signed copies of the reports from the San Diego Water Board database. In short, the information provided was insufficient to historically recreate the data, leading ELAP to question the integrity of the data reported by Wall. Based on the documentation and evidence that ELAP reviewed during the investigation phase, this is our understanding of how the data for Skyline originated and how Wall's laboratory reports were ultimately submitted to the San Diego Water Board. ELAP is unable, unable to verify that the samples were collected and analyzed by Skyline as the documentation provided by Wall was insufficient. What has been verified is that Skyline faxed raw data sheets to Wall. Wall generated laboratory reports on Wall letterhead and then faxed or emailed the laboratory reports to Skyline and EnviroTreat. EnviroTreat developed the QMRs on behalf of Skyline. Skyline signed the QMRs, which EnviroTreat then submitted to the San Diego Water Board. This graphic is a cradle to grave representation for the Skyline data. Skyline created raw data sheets and then faxed to Wall. Wall generated the laboratory reports on Wall letterhead and sent back to Skyline and EnviroTreat. EnviroTreat assembled the QMRs for Skyline signature. The QMRs were then submitted to the San Diego Water Board to demonstrate compliance with the permit. ELAP's investigation concluded with the denial of Wall's 2019 renewal application and the issuance of a monetary citation. These actions were principally based on the following violations. 
while generated results created without scientific measurement. Wall established a non-ELAP accredited auxiliary laboratory at Skyline. Wall held itself out as being accredited for standard methods 9221B. Wall made false statements to ELAP at the time of inspection. Wall generated reports lacking basic data integrity information and Wall was unable to provide training records for Skyline staff. Now that I have described for you the origin of this case, how ELAP obtained the evidence, understanding of the facts, and the principal violations that Wall committed, these are the five key issues that we are here today to resolve. Did Wall's creation of reports for Skyline with call form sampling results violate the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Act? Was Wall operating a laboratory at Skyline? Was the issuance of a citation to Wall for civil liability in the amount of $137,841.60 appropriate? Was the denial of Wall's application for renewal accreditation appropriate? And has Wall implemented corrective actions to address these problems? I will start with key issues number one and number two. Wall reported results for a test it did not perform. Wall misrepresented material facts in reports designed for regulatory purposes. Wall established a non-ELAP accredited auxiliary laboratory at Skyline. These are violations of the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Act and are the basis for ELAP's underlying action against Wall. Reporting results for a test Wall did not perform is data fabrication. They reported results without performing the analysis. To say it another way, the reports that Wall generated were created without Wall's own scientific measurement. This is data fabrication. Uh, I'm going to object. I, it sounds more like a statement and a conclusory and this than the evidence. I mean, I've let it go for a while, but we're objecting that these are just conclusions. I haven't heard any evidence yet. And we're going to keep, we're going to object if we don't hear evidence. This sounds like a, a, a statement. So we would motion to strike any of this prior conversation just as legal conclusions and, and their conclusions about what they think the evidence is going to show. We haven't seen any evidence. I'll, yeah, at this point, I'll, I'll note the objection. And we'll take it under advisement. Thank you. Thank you. Wall does not even have the equipment necessary to perform the method that the laboratory reports claimed were used. Instead, Wall generated laboratory reports on Wall letterhead using unsupported data sheets provided by the regulated discharger. That is to say, Wall's reports were fabricated using information from an unaccredited source information that Wall didn't attempt to verify the integrity or defensibility of, and information that in some cases was either incomplete and or contained pre-filled information. Even Mr. Conti admits that Wall never received or analyzed samples from Skyline. This quote comes directly from Mr. Conti's testimony. Wall was not collecting or receiving any samples or conducting any total coliform analysis under standard methods 9221B. Reporting results for analysis that did not occur in your laboratory is data fabrication. In total, ELAP identified over 3,000 fabricated results, none of which were obtained by Wall's own scientific measurement. If Wall didn't receive or analyze the samples, where did the results come from? They came from an unaccredited source. 
which means not only was Wall fabricating data by reporting results that were created without Wall's own scientific measurement, the raw data sheets the reports were based off were entirely inappropriate as the basis for accredited laboratory data. The raw data sheets were produced without appropriate oversight of analytical and operational activities. The analysis was performed by individuals who had minimal or no training at all and with no documented initial or ongoing demonstration of capability to perform the analysis. The tests were performed without quality control samples to verify that the analysis was performed correctly. There are no chain of custody records to provide a reviewable trail for defensibility and traceability. And as I will show you in the next set of slides, there are instances where the raw data sheets have missing information and are incomplete. Even more alarming is that starting in April of 2015, the data sheets were pre-filled, in indicating that the confirmation phase of the test was never performed. This is further evidence that Wall's creation of reports for Skyline violated the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Act. Depicted here on the left is a portion of the raw data sheet that was faxed to Wall. On the right is a portion of the corresponding laboratory report generated by Wall. As you can see on the left, the second reading of the presumptive phase of the test on the August 24, 2017 sample was inexplicably missing. Yet as you can see on the right, Wall reported the results anyways. The second reading at 48 hours is required by the method. This is data fabrication. Keep in mind, this is only one example. More are identified in the record before the State Board. Depicted here on the left again is a portion of the raw data sheet that was faxed to Wall. On the right is a portion of the corresponding laboratory report generated by Wall. For these samples from September of 2014, the testing was never even completed. The test does not have a completion time or a record of who completed it. Again, Wall fabricated the data. The method requires an incubation time of 48 hours. If there is no documentation of the time the analysis was completed or who the analyst was, then the validity of this data cannot be confirmed. Same objection, making legal conclusions about fabrication. These are not all the documents that were shared. Objection noted. Thank you. In this instance, from February of 2015, data was both missing and the testing was incomplete. Yet again, Wall reported the results anyways. This here is an example of the pre-filled raw data sheets. Beginning in 2015, Skyline began pre-filling in the results of the confirmation phase of the testing. This is a deviation from standard methods 9221B and essentially renders the results invalid. There is no scientific or technical explanation for pre-filling a section when you do not know if it will be used until after the first part of the test is finished. Objection calls for an uh, expert opinion. Now he's an expert with an expert opinion on what this means. Same objection. And you can cross him on, on those. You'll have that ability. Yes, but I want to make my objection heard. At the it's time, noted. Okay. So it's timely. Thank you. And as you can see in the box in the corner of the December 1st, 2017 sample, it's empty. Could that have been a positive result? How can you pre-fill the confirmation phase if the presumptive phase was not completed? And the fact is, Wall knew better. Fabricated data is counter to Wall's own quality assurance document. 
This comes from page four of the quality assurance document. One of the primary responsibilities of any laboratory is to ensure the accuracy and precision of its results. It is even more vital in the case of an environmental laboratory since our results are often directly related to public health and are the basis for decisions that have enormous financial impact. So not only is wall in violation of ELAP statute and regulation, they are in violation of their own quality assurance principles. In addition to fabricating data, wall misrepresented material facts in reports that were submitted for regulatory purposes. This further supports the significance of this case and why the water board should be concerned. As you can see from the pictures on the right, the total coliform results were presented on wall letterhead. Along with key pieces of information that would lead a reasonable person to believe that the analysis was performed by an ELAP accredited laboratory. The reports include WALL's ELAP certificate number. They identify that WALL is an ELAP accredited laboratory. And the reports are signed by the laboratory director, Mr. Conti. And furthermore, the reports were made to appear as if they were intended to be used to demonstrate compliance with Skyline's regulatory permit. As you can see, the reports include Skyline's permit number and denote the use of standard method 9221B. Lastly, the third principal violation of the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Act. Wall established a non-ELAP accredited auxiliary laboratory at Skyline. Skyline was Wall's auxiliary laboratory. Wall provided the initial training of Skyline staff. Wall continuously provided supplies and materials. Wall disposed of Skyline's laboratory waste. Wall received raw data from Skyline. Wall reviewed and evaluated raw data from Skyline, and Wall reported the results from Skyline. Wall did everything except arguably the most important things, oversee and supervise daily operation of the laboratory, apply for accreditation, and pay the staff. Wall could have sought accreditation for the auxiliary laboratory and done things the right way. But instead, Wall benefited by not obtaining accreditation for the auxiliary laboratory. Wall avoided expenses of accreditation, staffing, and required testing materials. Wall received payment without providing testing services. And Wall was able to provide a substandard level of service than what is expected from an ELAP accredited laboratory. Had the facility at Skyline been accredited, ELAP may have taken a different course of action. In summary, ELAP identified a total of 3,284 known instances of fabricated data over a period of 10 years. Wall's reports misled regulators at the San Diego Water Board and Wall did not attempt to accredit the auxiliary location at Skyline. These are all violations of the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Act. And Mr. Conti, as the lab director and signatory of the laboratory reports, is responsible. Now that I've addressed the State Water Board key issues number one and number two, I will address the remaining key issues by covering the reasonableness of ELAP's actions and evaluation of Wall's corrective action. ELAP cannot allow accredited laboratories to violate the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Act and the California Code of Regulations, which the evidence demonstrates Wall did. As a result, ELAP issued a citation 
for one hundred and thirty seven thousand eight hundred and forty one dollars and sixty cents the penalty amount was limited to one thousand five hundred and four instances of fabricated data during march first twenty fourteen to april twentieth twenty eighteen this covers the time period that mr conti served as laboratory director the penalty assessed is significantly lower than the maximum penalty allowed by law, which would have been 1.5 million. Mr. Conti's claimed revenue in buildings is $114,500. The penalty assessed offsets the direct economic benefit while obtained by recovering slightly more than Mr. Conti's claimed revenue. The following is a short explanation of how the civil penalty was calculated. As required by California Health and Safety Code, the civil penalty issued must be calculated for each violation. To do this, ELAP calculated the average number of violations per invoice and then the amount invoiced per each violation. A multiplier based on treble damages was applied resulting in $91.65 per each violation. Considering only the instances of fabricated data that Mr. Conti is responsible for, the total amount cited is equal to $137,841.60. The citation is reasonable and will serve as a deterrent to other laboratories who may be tempted to fabricate data. while generated 10 years of fabricated data. This has severely compromised confidence in the data Wall produces. ELAP attempted to work with Mr. Conti to restore data integrity at Wall and supports the actions Wall has taken to address the minor violations identified during the ELAP's unannounced inspection, which include flagging samples analyzed outside of Wall removing expired reagents, specifying that staff cannot wear shorts in the lab, correcting procedures for collection of samples, correcting procedures for calibration of walls analytical balance, and correcting an inappropriate technique described in the standard operating procedure for a separate microbiological method. However, these corrective measures do not mitigate or correct the principal underlying data integrity violations, nor do they prevent them from recurring in the future. ELAP believes that appropriate corrective actions for Wall would be the adoption of a laboratory quality management system, demonstration of training in ethics and data integrity for Wall staff, including the laboratory director, and a comprehensive third-party data audit to ensure that the quality of all other data produced by Wall. In particular, ELAP recommends Wall implement a quality management system that is specific to the environmental laboratory industry. It is critical, especially for Wall, that the quality management system include, com include components that address quality, integrity, and validity of the data. For example, having defined responsibilities for review of data would prevent undue influence on laboratory staff who are responsible for overseeing and reviewing the quality of data produced by Wall. Documented policies and procedures for data integrity and ethics, including training and confidential reporting of data integrity issues is a key element in preventing data fabrication and lab fraud. Control of records and documentation traceability is essential to ensuring the validity of data that an environmental testing laboratory produces. A quality management system that includes preventative actions would require Wall to address the root cause of the data integrity violations and evaluate the effectiveness of the implemented preventative measures. Having procedures for proper, full, and complete documentation for samples received and a policy on what the laboratory will do when the sample does not meet acceptance criteria would improve Wall's ability to historically recreate the data. 
Mr. Conti has suggested through his sworn statement that his laboratory is willing to conform to an external standard. However, his suggested standard, ISO 17025, does not address these key components and therefore is not the most appropriate external standard for an environmental testing laboratory such as WAL. The big issue is not what lab staff are wearing or that their support equipment is calibrated. The big issue is ensuring the quality, integrity, and validity of the data. Denial is not the death penalty, but it is absolutely the right course of action. ELAP does not want to close laboratories. However, ELAP cannot accredit laboratories who submit fabricated data for regulatory compliance. WAL has not com implemented corrective action that corrects the violations that are at the root cause for the denial. Without change, ELAP does not have confidence that a situation like this would be prevented from recurring. Simply saying it won't happen again is not a sufficient correction. If you don't think it's a problem, how can you identify a solution? And the fact is, other laboratories have regained accreditation after correcting reasons for the denial. So should WALL demonstrate a commitment to improving its data integrity, ELAP could re-accredit the laboratory. ELAP has shown that WALL violated the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Act by fabricating data, misrepresenting material facts, and establishing an auxiliary laboratory at Skyline. We have also shown that WALL has not yet made the necessary corrections to defend the quality of the data it produces, and therefore, ELAP's actions are appropriate and justifiable under the circumstances. ELAP's recommended board decision is to uphold the citation and denial of application. In conclusion, California's regulatory programs have a vested interest in ELAP's ability to ensure data produced by accredited laboratories is sufficient for its intended use. By upholding the citation and denial of application, California's regulatory programs and the entire laboratory community will know that the State Water Board is committed to ensuring that ELAP accredited laboratories produce data that is scientifically valid and of a known and documented quality. This is the close of ELAP's presentation, and I now yield the floor to Mr. Knight. Thank you, Mr. Oaxaca. I would call Mr. or call, excuse me, Dr. Alain LaBelle to the lectern. Dr. LaBelle, could you please state your name and spell it for the record, please? Alon LaBelle, A-L-O-N-L-E-B-E-L. -E -E Dr. LaBelle, are you the owner and operator of EnviroTreat Incorporated? Yes, I am. And in that capacity, um, I've given you a copy of the prosecution team. Um, it's the hand testimony, Exhibit 1, an EnviroTreat uh, Incorporated letter. Do you have that copy? Yes, I do. And, and the June 1st, right? Yeah, could you identify that letter for me? Yes, it's uh, a June 1st, 2018 letter to John Automart uh, of the Water Quality Control Board, San Diego region, uh, in response to inspection of Skyland Ranch Country Club. And did you author that letter? Yes. And when you authored that letter, were the statements you made in it true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. Thank you. I don't have any further questions at this time. I just reserve Dr. LaBelle for the remainder of the hearing for um, cross-examination and rebuttal. Thank you. That will allow um, Wall to proceed with cross-examination.
Again, good afternoon. William Carter on behalf of Western. And I'd like to introduce Mr. Greg Conti, Lab Director at Western, and my colleague, Steve Eli. Uh, what we've heard here uh, are a lot of conclusions. I haven't heard a lot of evidence today, and again, we've made our objections. We've heard a lot of conclusions, but not a lot of sworn testimony as to evidence. And I think that the problem with this case is that ELAB has I'm sorry, this is, um, this is your opportunity for cross-examination. I'm going to make an opening statement, if I may. Um, I think you'll have your opportunity for an opening oh. statement. Well, I, then I misread that. Uh, then I would uh, ask to... Okay. Uh, does the prosecution team have any issue with um, an opening statement being delivered at this point? You know what? I can do it later. Uh, I'll wait. Okay. Whatever you, whatever works, I can do. What I'd like to do, though, is uh, my focus would be the cross-examination first of Mr. Le Dr. Labelle, and if he would take a seat wherever is appropriate. Test. May I? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. LaBelle. Dr. LaBelle, how long have you been a consultant for Skyline? Uh, since about 2001, 2002. So you were working for Skyline before you brought in Western to work with Skyline? Yes. So Skyline was your client? Yes. And at some point in 2008, you asked Western to con perform some services for you, correct? Actually, it was uh, before. It was when we started the plant in 2005. They, they started to uh, do the compliance, and maybe even before that. So Skyline was your client first? Skyline was my client. The, con the, the Western was there to work for Skyline. But you brought, you brought Western in, is that correct? I brought them in. I've, I've worked with them before. And as part of that, you worked with someone from Western named Joe Zimmer, correct? And in about 2008, you asked Mr. Zimmer to help you set up a laboratory at Skyline? Not exactly. Uh, was a laboratory set up? No. What, what was at Skyline? Was there a laboratory at Skyline, all? there was no laboratory. Was there any type of analysis done at Skyline? No. You've heard the nature of this case is that there have been allegations that Skyline was performing some type of total coliform analysis? Correct. When did that start? When, uh, at the end of 2008. All right, and you asked Mr. That. Zimmer to do that? He didn't ask him to do it. I talked to him and, uh, and essentially Western offered to set up a lab there. We're looking for a solution. It's a little more complicated than that. And they did, uh, was a laboratory set up? Yes. Um, and was there training done? At that time, yes. Who performed the training? Joe Zimmer. And yes. how many times did he perform the training? I, I know f the first time that he did. I was so not it was one time. Anymore. Is that correct? In 2008? Yes. Later. And after that, who performed the training? Nobody. Were the same employees at Skyline between 2008 and 2018 conducting the total color form? Uh, no. Some, I, I know that it, at least one of them passed away, and uh, uh, there were other employees. And did Mr. Zimmer train them? I don't believe so. I don't know. Who trained them? I don't know. Isn't it true that you trained the people at Skyline to perform the total coliform test? No, it's not true. Who did? I don't know. There were just maybe one trained the other, but I was not, I was not part of it because I was there, not there every day. I was there once well, a month. There were no Western employees at Skyline, were there? No. 
they were an extension of the lab. Who, who at, were there any Western employees supervising the people at Skyline? No. And isn't it true that the Skyline uh, staff performed the total coliform procedure? They did it by themselves? Yes. And they, they used the procedure a, from Western. And they used a 10 tube procedure, correct? They used a what? A 10 tube procedure. I, I'm not a chemist, so they, they used the procedure that was provided to them. And a uh, ten, ten tube, yeah, ten tube, correct. And they perf they actually performed those tests, correct? And then when they performed those tests, they sent the raw data sheets to Western, correct? Yes. And so were they fabricating or or falsifying tests at Skyline? I don't believe so. Were you falsifying tests or fabricating no. tests? that were performing the tests. So as far as you understand, all the tests were performed by Skyline staff and they weren't fabricating data. Okay. And when you would, uh, you would receive reports from Western that calculated the tests that were performed or the analysis that was performed by Skyline, correct? No, I received the final report. I received the report that had the final results. And it went and to... It went to you. You received it from yes, Western. Correct. And then you prepared the uh, monitoring reports that went to the water board, correct? Yes. And you correct them by yourself or with Skyline? I, I did what? Did you prepare them by yourself or did you I work with Skyline? I prepared them by myself. They're you signed standard. them. And you signed them? No. Well, I signed, but they were certified by Skyline. Correct. Was uh, Western involved at all in the preparation of those? Of the monitoring reports, reports? No. How much were you paid a month in 2000, between 2008 and 2018 to do work for Skyline? I don't know. I need to look. My, my job was to oversee the, the operation and to prepare reports. I was there in the beginning twice a month, and then I was there once a month over the last, uh, I think, couple of years. And, uh, you know, it's a pretty standard plant. It's a plant that was very well supported and accepted by the water board for many, many years as a private small plant. And uh, then came 2018 and uh, the... Um, you've heard allegations here that people were falsifying data. Or... Yeah, I, I heard. Are you aware of any falsified data in this matter? No. Have you seen any falsified data in this matter? I have not. Are you aware of any falsified data? No. I have no further questions. Thank you. I have some questions based on that. Dr. LaBelle, uh, you testified that you were at Skyline uh, once or twice a month. Is that correct? And did you frequently observe the total coliform testing yourself? In other words, did you go look at the tubes being analyzed? Not at all. This was not part of my... So is it fair to say you didn't see the, the coliform testing occur every day? No, I haven't seen it, no. And so you're only... You say that you're aware of them performing the test. How are you aware of that? Well, I know because I know the, the people that operate it, and I... I uh... That they were doing the job. So your statements are based not on the fact that you have actually observed the coliform test, but by the statements of the people at Skyline. Right. So in fact, you didn't see the coliform testing occur on a regular basis. No. Did you supervise the lab work at Skyline? Did you supervise the employees performing the lab work at Skyline? No. Did you operate an auxiliary laboratory at Skyline? No. I have no further questions. Who supervised the people at Skyline? As far as the, the test, not me. They were doing their test. Well, they were, just they on their own? It's a very simple test. And this was, Frankly, it's a they really just were doing it on their own? Test. Yeah, I mean, it's, they, they were doing it, uh, you know, the background of all this, this situation is that this is a very remote location that was very difficult to comply with the six hour whole time and, and the daily test. And they're doing it right now, but it's a very, very difficult 
task for the people of Skyline. Uh, so the purpose was not of, I, I believe the Sky, that Western was, were trying to essentially facilitate a solution to a situation that this was the only wastewater plant, especially in the beginning, the only plant that was actually uh, a Title 22 approved system uh, in that area. You say that the only contact you see that you knew of with Joe Zimmer was in 2008 when the lab was set up. Regarding that, yes. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe so. I have no further questions. We don't have any further questions. Dr. LaBelle, uh, did you ever send the quarterly monitoring reports to Wall? No, never did. It was the other way around. Thank you. I have no further questions of Dr. Okay, LaBelle. You're excused. I would ask to cross-examine Mr. Oaxaca. May we just reserve Dr. LaBelle's presence for the remainder of the hearing? Yes. No objection to that. May I you proceed? Mr. Oaxaca, uh, Mr. Oaxaca, you're aware that as early as October of 2018, Western uh, agreed or offered to implement a third party independent audit of its lab? My understanding is that they would um, allow for an, a third party independent assessment audit of their laboratory. But they were willing to, in addition to the other changes they made in 2008, they were willing to implement a third party audit. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. But you didn't, you didn't put that in your uh, analysis, did you? You didn't advise the hearing officer that they had offered to do that, did you? Um, can I review, please? Your Honor, I don't want, no, I, if I can, it's either a yes or no. I, it, he's not, I don't I'll, want I'll allow him a moment to review. Rather than you can cut, stop the clock on me then, Your Honor. Yeah, we, we will do that. Thank you. Did not include it in the presentation. Um, Thank you. But in your in your arguments, I, I, you, I will say that I did um, say it verbally. Uh, you, but in terms of your arguments to the to the hearing officer, you've indicated, at least in the analysis, quote. I think this is in your statement. Um, if law were, if Western were to subject itself to an independent third party, it would quote, be a clear demonstration that Wall was taking steps to address the data integrity issues present in the lab, close quote. You also stated in your analysis, it would help restore ELAP's confidence in the Wall reports if they did that. So, is it you're saying that with all the allegations that are made against Wall, if they were to subject themselves to a third party auditor, you would believe that would restore the data integrity for that entity? If we're talking about a third party data audit, um, then yes, I believe so. But in your analysis, it's either TNI, TNI or nothing? Um, no, that's one possible solution. So it could be something other than TNI. Yes. Now, when you were doing your investigation, did you interview Skyline employees? Can you repeat that? During your investigation of Western, did you interview Skyline employees? 
No, Western, uh, excuse me, Skyline is not an ELAP accredited laboratory. Well, did you ever interview any Skylab employee, uh, employee and say, who supervises you? Objection asked and answered. Not of Mr. Oaxaca. He asked him if he interviewed any employees and Mr. Oaxaca said no. Saint. Did you uh, find any evidence to show who was supervising Skyline employees? No, Wall did not provide any. Did you find any documents that showed who was training Skyline employees at the lab? Only Mr. Conti's statement. And that, that referred to an incident in 2008? Correct. So between 2008 and 2018, did you see any evidence who was providing training to Skyline employees at the lab? No, I did not. Isn't it true that when uh, Mr. Alon, Dr. Alon submitted his quarterly monthly reports, he indicated in those reports that he was conducting the training? I do not recall. If I showed you something, would it refresh your recollection? Yes, sir. I'm going to show you uh, January 15th, 2018, quarterly report. I think it's Exhibit L of the of Western's exhibits, page 2-2. See that? Would you take a look at that, please? And these are the quarterly reports that uh, EnviroTreat would submit to the regional board on behalf of Skyline, signed by Skyline on Mr. or Dr. LaBelle. And on page 2.2, doesn't it indicate who's conducting the training of those people? I'm going to object that the document speaks for itself. Dr. LaBelle's. I'm sorry? I can't hear it speak. Uh, oh, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, the document speaks for itself. Dr. LaBelle is here if he wants to question Dr. LaBelle about what Dr. LaBelle's document says. Um, he hasn't laid the foundation that Mr. Walker has read this. I don't know if Mr. Walker has indicated that he has read it. Uh, I'm going to ask for judicial notice. This is a quarterly report that's submitted to the. Uh, Regional Board, and this was this was part of the citation that was submitted by the by ELAP. This is a a document that's uh, part of the record already, and this is this has also been submitted as Exhibit L in the in Western's matter. And I would have to the reason I'm asking is I'm assuming Mr. Oaxaca has read these documents. But, so the question is the question is whether or not Mr. Oaxaca knows whether or not Dr. LaBelle did the training based on what Dr. LaBelle said in Dr. LaBelle's document. Why not ask Dr. LaBelle? No, it's more simple than that. Does this document indicate who's conducting the training at Skyline for the Skyline employees? It's that simple. On J in January of 2018. It says here that Rich Carrion and Sharon Reed were trained by Dr. LaBelle. Thank you. Those people you named, those are Skyline employees? Yes. I have no further questions. Thank you. We have a couple of just follow-up questions of the witnesses. May I have a moment to redirect Mr. Oaxaca? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Mr. Oaxaca, those, um, you just testified about the fact that two people named in Dr. LaBelle's report were trained. Does it indicate what they were trained for in the report? No. Is it possible that they were trained to run the wastewater treatment plant that Dr. LaBelle designed? Objection, speculation. Go ahead. Go ahead and answer. It is possible. Does it specifically say that they were trained in the performance of standard method 9221B or a total coliform analysis? 
It does not. Nothing further. Is it possible that training was for, for SM9221B? Is it possible? Yes. Thank you. So these questions that we have um, wouldn't count against the parties at all. Okay. Do you want to go? Okay. Mr. Oaxaca, um, it seemed like there was some sort of distinction you were trying to make between a, a third party audit and a third party data audit. Um, would you describe what you mean by a third party data audit versus a third party audit? Yeah, so um, a third party data audit would, would uh, entail um, an analytical data review um, and, and specifically a level four data package review. Um, that would include everything from the cradle to grave for a, a particular sample or batch uh, conducted by the, by the laboratory. Um, so that would include chain of custody, um, just chain of custody um, sample receipt, uh, activities that for preparation of the, these, um, the sample, going into um, analysis of the sample, reviewing the raw data sheets uh, generated by uh, an instrument or whether, or if there was no instrument involved, just the raw data sheets. Um, then it would go, you know, document that the sample was, um, had a second level of review. Um, it would include uh, documentation that uh, of all the um, materials, media, supplies that were involved um, with the performance of the, uh, excuse me, with the um, analysis of the sample. Um, so that is what we um, were specifically referring to as a, as a data audit. Um, now an assessment um, would be more of a overall look at the laboratory, um, you know, similar to what eLab does uh, when we go to a, la a lab um, assessing their capability and competency uh, to perform a method, but it would not um, specifically include an in-depth in analytical data review. And so would that be done, the data audit, um, like on an ongoing basis, or is it sort of they, sh they show up? Like how, how would one sort of um, hire someone to do that for them? Um, so the process is, is the, um, the third party would um, request a number of data packages or um, from the laboratory uh, requesting a level four data package. The laboratory would provide that electronically and then the um, third party data audit company would uh, perform the data analysis and provide a report. So would this be more like a um, sort of like surprise thing where they would say, oh, give us the data for what you did on two weeks ago or so it's not something someone could plan for and um, make sure that they were doing everything they're supposed to do on that day. Right. We would we would prefer that um, it would be random. And, and cover a course of um, several years. So maybe a few times a year sort of thing for several years, is that what you're, no? Um, possibly either, you know, go several times over a year or over several clients, um, you know, just at random. And would it just be a one-time thing or how, I guess I'm not following, would, would, would one hire someone to do this just one time or would, is what you're thinking would be, they would have to have this done um, several times or monthly or like? Um, well, we would be open to a one-time or an ongoing um, type data review. Can you ever think of a situation where um, a lab would create a report based on information coming from someone else? I mean, is, is that common at all? No. 
So there um, wouldn't ever be a situation you could think of where data from someplace else was raw data sheets were submitted or in a report made based on that information. There are instances where a laboratory may subcontract samples to a, a subcontracted laboratory. The subcontracted laboratory would perform the analysis and then provide um, a data package which may include the raw data um, to that first laboratory. Um, that laboratory would then include that report from the subcontractor laboratory as part of their laboratory data report. Can you speak to your authority to inspect laboratories? You mentioned earlier that you, uh, because the Skyline facility was not an ELAP accredited laboratory, you inferred that you didn't have the authority to inspect it. Yes, that's correct. Um, ELAP acc accredits environmental testing laboratories, and so uh, the health and I mean, we we wouldn't go to a facility that is not accredited or, or seeking accreditation. But at the same time, um, you've also uh, asserted that Wall has been was operating an auxiliary laboratory, which would then fall under their accreditation. But they they had not sought accreditation for that um, auxiliary laboratory. Right, so does your authority prevent you from, if you believe that there is an auxiliary facility, laboratory facility being operated by an ELAP accredited lab, does your authority limit you from inspecting those facilities? I'm not sure. I have a quick question, Mr. Ohaka. You mentioned that um, a recommendation would to be uh, include an ethics and integrity training for Wall. Can you explain the extent of that training that you're recommending? Um, uh, it would be a um, in in person type training, classroom type training. Uh, discussing et data integrity and ethics. It would um, be required for all laboratory staff, um, including the um, laboratory director, and um, it would be required for all new employees of the laboratory or um, ongoing or employees who are already, um, you know, hired, and it would be required um, to be performed uh, annually or um, at the time of at the beginning of employment. Um, it would also uh, so can you clarify? You just asked about the training, right? Okay, thank you. Any action been taken against Skyline or EnviroTreat in this matter? It is my understanding that um, they, the regional board issued them, the San Diego Regional Board issued them a notice of violation. And I believe that's included in the evidence package. I, I believe that was a part of our citation. We don't have any more questions. Thank you. On that point, Mr. Oaxaca, was there any notices of violation issued against EnviroTreat for, for data fraud? Not that I'm aware of. What about Skyline? Any NOVs for data fraud? No, they were. Um, they did get a notice of violation um, for failure to comply with data requirements of the permit, and improper procedures for total call form sampling and analysis. And as aren't they ultimately responsible to make sure that they are submitting analysis through an accredited lab? Isn't it their responsibility? 
that is a requirement of the permit. And what about EnviroTreat? What about them? Aren't they required to make sure they're using an accredited laboratory? Uh, the permit is to Skyline. Any actions that you know of against EnviroTreat? Not that I'm aware of. Further questions? I have just a couple questions based on that, if that's all right. Go ahead. Mr. Waka, do you have, are you aware of any jurisdictional capacity that ELAP has over EnviroTreat? No. And with regard to the data audit questions, um, you'd indicated that a, a data audit would satisfy ELAP's concerns over the data integrity issues identified at Western. Wouldn't that depend on the result of the data audit? Yes, it would. Nothing further. Mr. Oaxaca, you have the authority to refer matters to other agencies, don't you? Yes. And you did not refer this to another agency, did you? Uh, the San Diego Water Board referred this case to us. But my question is, oh. did you refer this to some other agency for data fraud or data set fabrication? No, sir. Thank you. Has the prosecution team completed? Yes, we've completed our case in chief. We'd move all of our exhibits and testimony into evidence um, along with the letter from Dr. Lobel. That was the letter that was already in? It's an exhibit to Mr. Han's testimony. I believe it's also included in the um, enormous number of exhibits in the original evidence package. So it's probably in there twice. Okay. Thank you. We're going to make the same objection. We believe these are hearsay statements. Their, de their declarations were, their statements were not submitted under penalty of perjury. We have not heard any real testimony here other than conclusions. As, as opposed to Mr. Conte, who submitted all of his doc statements under penalty of perjury in declarations months ago. Thank you. You have made your objection and, and it's noted. So. And I'm going to make Thank one you. more, uh, if I may. There is an exhibit that we definitely think should not be included. It's, it's rank hearsay. And it's uh, exhibit two uh, that's under the testimony of Mr. Hand. It's a, it's a letter from an attorney, Kutak Rock. It's signed by a lawyer, Mr. Davis. It's, it's all hearsay. It's an attorney reciting what he believes the facts are. There's no attribution to a person or to my client or to Mr. Lavelle or to anyone. That document is hearsay, and we object to that coming in. It's written by an advocate for his client. I can't imagine an attorney ever being dishonest in a written uh, work like that, uh, but we would submit that matter to the water board. Okay, that objection is noted separately, so we'll take a look. I'm not saying anything about that lawyer. I, I know he's a fine person, but he's an advocate for his client and there's no attribution in that letter as to who said what. My understanding is he substantially restates what Dr. LaBelle has testified to and what's in Dr. LaBelle's letter. So the two are related. I, I think this is, a, this is a good point to take a quick bio break. So let's take a, a 10 minute break and come back at 2.40.
Okay. Thank you. Uh, if I may, I will defer the opening statement and go directly to the direct examination of Mr. Conti. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Conti, what's your position at Western? I'm the laboratory director. And how long have you been at Western? Since 1990. And uh, when did you become laboratory director? In 2005. And what's your ownership interest, if any, in Western? Um, I own it. When did you become the sole owner of Western? Um, well, the, it's still in a buyout, but in, around 2015. And who were the other owners at Western? Joseph Zimmer and Doug Knight. And how long had they owned uh, Western before you? Since 1970. How long has Western been in operation? Since 1970. How many employees do you have? Uh, currently 16. Uh, where'd you go to school? Uh, UCR, University of California, Riverside. What's your degree? Uh, BS in chemistry. Uh, now, in this matter, you've uh, filled out a number, prepared and filled out and signed a number of declarations. Is that correct? Correct. And you understand those are under penalty of perjury? Yes. And those documents are accurate to your knowledge and recollection? Yes. Including the exhibits that you've attached to them? Yes. Now, do you know someone named Al Dr. Alain LaBelle? Yes, I do. How do you know him? Um, just he, we do work for him for quite a few years, as long as I can remember. And uh, do you do work for him related to Skyline, the, the company that's been discussed here? Correct. How long have, uh, has uh, uh, Western been doing work for uh, Skyline? Um, apparently since 2008. I couldn't say if there was anything going on before that. Uh, what, if any, involvement did you have in Skyline uh, work? None. How will you understand that Western became started working with Skyline? Um, uh, Dr. LaBelle approached Joe Zimmer to perform analysis required. When was that? Yeah. I would estimate 2008. But and this information that you're talking about, is this based on conversations you had with Mr. Zimmer, Mr. LaBelle, who? Um, just from kind of looking at the records. Okay. And as lab director, you've learned about the situation? Yes. And when did you first learn about this situation where there were allegations that Western may be doing uh, certain tests for Skyline? I think it was approximately April of 2017. Was it after that or before that? Um, when, did, when, were, when was your laboratory searched by ELAP? Um, I think they came out in June. Of what year? 2017. Was it 17 or 18? Oh, 2018, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just I'm want to here. clarify that. That's yeah. what it says in your declaration. So when did you first learn there might be issues with Skyline and uh, April analysis? April of 2018, sorry, not 17. Was Skyline the client of Western? No. Who was the client of Western relating uh, to Skyline? EnviroTreat. And that was Dr. LaBelle? Yes. Why do you say that? Why do you describe it that way? Um, because you provided all direction. Who, who, who provided all direction? Dr. LaBelle. And how did he do that? Uh, well, um, just initially setting up the clients and any, anything he needed as far as analysis, um, he, he would send a request to us. And part of your uh, declaration, including the one in the rebuttal, there are a number of exhibits that are attached with exit, with uh, emails and others. Do those from Dr. LaBelle to Western, do those document who is giving direction? Yes. And uh, how, did, uh, how did Western interact with Skyline? What, what, if any, involvement did Western have with Skyline? Uh, receiving receiving the fax, faxes from them. That's about it. What what did and we uh, would drop ship media to them? What did Skyline? What did Western receive from Skyline? Um, raw data sheets for their coliform testing. And what did Western do with those raw data sheets? Um, we generated monthly summaries. And what were the what was the what were those to be used for? As far as I know, it's for internal purposes. For who? For Elon. Dr. LaBelle? Yeah. And did you have any interaction with Skyline directly? No. Did you have any conversations with Skyline? No. Did you operate an auxiliary laboratory at Skyline? I didn't hear you. No. 
Who operated the laboratory at Skyline? Skyline, as far as I know. Did you have any employees at Skyline? No. Did you fund any of the activities at Skyline? No. Did you provide any of the training at Skyline? No. Is, your, your, is it your understanding that in 2008, Joe Zimmer uh, was asked by Dr. L LaBelle to come over and provide some training to some of the people at Skyline? Yes. Is it your understanding it was a one-time training? Yes. And Dr. LaBelle also asked Mr. Zimmer to set up a refrigerator or some other act or uh, uh, an incubator and other equipment over at Skyla Skyline. Is that correct? Correct. After that, was there any involvement by Western with Skyline's laboratory? Not as far as I know. Who performed the total coliform analysis at Skyline? In terms of people or? Yes. I, I don't know the, pe the people who did them. It but they were Skyline sta sc Sorry, Skyline staff. Do you provide any kind of supervision or direction no. to the Skyline Tech? Did Are you aware whether Western ever represented to Skyline that Western was uh, ELAP accredited to do SM 9221D? Not that I'm aware of. Did you ever make any representations like that? No. Did you ever make any representations like that to Skyline? No. What about to Dr. LaBelle? No. Are you aware of anyone at Western making those representations? No. There, uh, what, Skyline would use some type of media or test tubes when they would run the test, is that correct? Correct. And was that a 10-tube test? Correct. And a 10-tube test, that's authorized under SM9221B, is that correct? Yes. And is that for potable water? Yes. But that's a, that's a legitimate test under that standard method. Correct. And you're aware of that? Yes. The, the, the test, the test tubes and the media, how did Skyline receive those tubes and media? They were drop shipped to them from the manufacturer. Did Western send the test tubes and the media to Skyline? Well, we ordered them and they were drop shipped from the manufacturer. And who did you order them for? Well, they were sent to Skyline Attention Alon. But who ordered, who, who requested that you send the media and the tubes um, to it Skyline? Was it was just generally on a recurring schedule. So they were using a certain amount of tubes a month. So we would just automatically every couple of months put in an order for, for media for them. And who would request on occasion to send more tubes or have tubes there on a certain date? Dr. LaBelle. And you said that when these tubes were sent to Skyline, they were drop shipped by the manufacturer? Correct. And they were to the attention of Mr. Dr. LaBelle? Yes. And at some point, these tubes and media would be used or waste, correct? Right. Where did the waste tubes go? Um, Dr. LaBelle would, when he was up there during his trips, he would bring them back. Um, someone from our lab, generally Doug Knight or Joe Zimmer, would meet with him and pick up the spent media tubes and bring them back to the lab. So Dr. LaBelle was involved in bringing the tubes back from Skyline? Correct. And then at some point the tubes were uh, provided to Western? Correct. What did Western do with them? Um, we sterilized them and disposed of them. And these directions and these interactions with Dr. LaBelle about the tubes in the media, those are reflected in your declaration, correct? Correct. As well as the exhibits that reflect that? Yes. Uh, the, uh, the test tube, uh, the 10 versus the 15 test tube procedure, a lot was made of that in elapse analysis. Are you familiar with whether one of those analysis is more sensitive than the other? Uh, well, the 10-tube is more sensitive. So a 10-tube might actually give you a more sensitivity about what's in the analysis, what's Correct. in the media. And when these raw data sheets came to uh, Western, what exactly did Western do with it? Um, we would just um, look for the number of positives, compare them to the chart and standard methods, and generate a monthly summary. So. Uh, whether it was a 10-tube method or a 15-tube method, 
the, the Western uh, staff could look at the table of the standard method and do a calculation. Correct. And since w Western, they weren't doing the analysis, correct? They weren't doing the work. Correct. That was done by Dr. LaBelle and the Skyline people, correct? Yes. So did you need all this other information that ELAP has been talking about, no. chain of custody and all these, to do your, anal your yeah. calculations? And then what did you do with those reports after you were done with the calculations? Where'd they go? Um, they would be emailed to Elon. Did you ever send any to uh, Skyline? Not that I'm aware of. So as far as you know, all your Western reports went to specifically and exclusively to Dr. LaBelle? Yes. Uh, were you involved in any way in the preparation of the quarterly monitoring reports that went to the Water Board? No. Did you ever see them? No. Did you ever sign any of them? No. Were you ever told by Dr. LaBelle or anyone that your reports were going to be used by, for regulatory purposes? No. When, would you, when did you first learn that the Western re, uh, coliform calculations were being used for regulatory purposes? Um, when Alon called me. And when was that? Approximately April of 2018. And why did he call you? Um, to state that there may have been an issue with those. And what did he say, if anything, about it? Um, try to guess, basically on board that we we're... Objection, calls for hearsay. Noted. Objection noted. What did he say to you? Um, to agree with them that we were operating an auxiliary laboratory at Skyline. Was that the first time you'd ever heard that? Yes. And what did you say to Dr. LaBelle? I said that's impossible. And then what did you do, if anything? Um, well, we spoke some more, and he just kind of explained the situation a bit and kind of seemed to, you know, ease things over a little bit, um, seeing that it was a, a new inspector, and the previous inspector was fine with the situation for the better part of a decade. Um, well, Dr. LaBelle told you he was wondering why ELAP was investigating him? Well, ELAP wasn't inv investigating us at that point in time. Oh, the regional board. Well, no one was investigating us at that point. Yeah, the regional board was investigating, yeah, Skyline. And uh, Mr. Dr. LaBelle said the regional board has known about this for 10 years. Or right. To that effect? Correct. Okay. Uh, do you know whether that's true or not, whether the regional board knew for 10 years? I do not. Now, by the way, how much did the media cost? Well, over the course of 10 years, it varied greatly. At the end, um, it was around $729, I think. A month. So you, uh, the cost of the media and the tubes was a little over seven hundred dollars. Yeah, it's media and tubes are one the same. There's media in the tubes that are sold to them. So yeah, oh. it's it's seven hundred twenty nine dollars a month. What did you bill uh, uh, for this work for Skyline? At, at the end, it was nine hundred dollars a month. So you billed for all this work, the tubes, the cost of the tubes, doing the calculation. Nine hundred dollars, correct, a month, and the and the media cost seven hundred and twenty some dollars, correct. So your profit was a hundred dollars a month, correct. You know what Dr. LaBelle was making a month for Skyline? I no, I don't. There were some statements or allegations about there being missing data or missing raw data that came from. Uh, uh, Skyline, what, what do you have to say about that? Did Are you aware that there was any missing data? No, I wasn't. I mean, there was a few things that they showed. I never stated that all that data was complete. Um, but in general, some of the things that they, they, they stated we showed to be incorrect. In your, in your declaration, you talk about this overlap. Like, you might have uh, January uh, reports, and then you get... Uh, the last few days might not, they might be blank, right? Correct. And then the next month in February, you might see the complete work because some of the tests are in process, correct? Correct. So if one were just to look at a, a single month, you might see blanks, correct? Yeah, you, you would every month. So that, but the following month, they would all be filled out. Correct. Are you aware of any situation 
where somebody at Western filled in the blanks, just made up data. No. In fact, if when you had an opportunity to go back and look at some of these so-called missing data, is that correct? Correct. And how many examples, if any, did you see of missing data? I think two. Out of how many years? 10 years. And those were older, correct? Um, I don't recall the exact dates. But these were why Mr. Zimmer and Mr. Knight were there? Oh, and Mr. Knight, yes. Doug Knight, we should specify. The, uh, there were allegations that there were something, they, they, they used the term pre-filled. What, what does that mean, if you know? Um, well, that, I'm assuming it has to do with the NA on the confirmation phase that they were pre-filling out. What does that mean? What, what would that matter here, if you know? Um, it just means that they weren't performing the confirmation phase or just going with the presumptive, which would be a worst case scenario. So the presumptive would tell you what the confirmation Yeah, the confirmation could never come out higher than the presumptive. And so uh, that would not be a concern for Western when, based on the type of work you were asked to do? No. So you were doing your calculations based on the standard method and the table in the standard method? Correct. Which allows for a 10-2 procedure, correct? Correct. And also, how many clients does Western have? Uh, approximately 1,900. And this is one of those 1,900. Right. Were you involved in any way in the setup or the organization or the management of what Mr. Zimmer had done in 2008, carrying through to early 2018? When no. You first, so you weren't involved. Your signature appears on some of these reports. Is that right? Yes. When did you first start actually signing this? Um, about mid-2017. Um, we were preparing for Doug Knight's retirement. Um, he's the one who handled all the reporting and client relations up to that point in time. So prior to mid-2017, how was your signature appearing on these reports? Um, those were electronic copies, and Doug Knight was electronically signing and forming. And what was Doug Knight's position? Chairman. The, how many... Western reports for Skyline did you actually sign, physically sign? I physically signed 16 reports. So not thousands. You physically didn't sign thousands of reports. Are you aware of any data fabrication by Western? No. Are you aware of any data fabrication by Skyline? No. Are you aware of any data fabrication by Dr. LaBelle? No. As far as you know, they were conducting the 10 tube test. Yes. And as far as you know, they were submitting the raw data to Western. Yes. Western was calculating those numbers. Yes. Did you ever represent to, uh, well, you, they were asked questions about why, or the allegation was that you were, you were sh telling the world that you were accredited for SM9221B. Were you doing that on your reports? No. Why was, why did it say accredited on your reports? Um, that was just on our letterhead, much like our address, phone number, who is for reference. Um, clients would constantly call asking for our ELAP number, LA County Sanitation number, et cetera. So we um, put that on our letterhead, so to aid them in, in getting information they need. It was, and that wasn't intended to imply everything we do was accredited on, the, on that letterhead. And, and that's, you've seen that on other labs, haven't you? Oh, yes. So other labs commonly do that, don't yes. they? Yes. They don't break out every analysis they're accredited for, do they? No. Have you, have you seen any other laboratories being prosecuted or enforced against because they had that letterhead where they said they're e lab accredited? No. The, uh, once you heard about this problem with ELAP, um, did you take corrective measures? Yes. Did you uh, mo update and modify your standard operating uh, procedures? Yes. Did you uh, make changes on your 
uh, lab reports, including as it related to Dr. LaBelle? Yes. Did you uh, indicate that you're, you continue to do work for Dr. LaBelle, is that right? Correct. And then I think in your declaration, you said you started to modify the, the reports and you put OLS on it, correct? Right. Outside lab was doing this? Outside, outside lab skyline was the flag. So on our flag sheet, we would have had that definition. And you also uh, changed some of the definitions. You inserted an NE, didn't you? Yeah, that was later, yes. That meant? Not for that would be for if we were performing non-E lab accredited data for someone results. So it would be flagged NE so as to avoid any confusion. Uh, when you were, uh, ELAP did an inspection of your facility in, on June 8, 20th of 18, and they, they said that maybe your answers weren't to their liking. When they came to interview you, had, did you know the full story behind the relationship between Mr. Zimmer and Dr. LaBelle at that time of the interview? I'm not following. In other words, did you have, by, when, they, when ELAP inter, uh, came to your facility in June of 18, did you have any concept of the relationship that uh, Mr. Zimmer had with Dr. LaBelle prior to? Regarding this, this yes. project or just in general? This project. Um, just vaguely. Did you have any notion of who was training who and when that training took place? Um, not prior to this, no. So did you learn subsequent? Yes. What the relationship had been? Yes. Okay. And in response to ELAP's request for documentation, did you provide that information to them? Um, I, as far as I know. Did you provide them everything they asked for? Um, I think most everything. I don't think I could find all the raw data, but everything I could track down, which I think was the majority of it. So you cooperated with their request? Yes. Uh, and what about, did you at some point in the fall of 2018 advise ELAP that you were willing to implement a third party independent auditor program to make sure that your lab was complying with certain data integrity yes. procedures? And you continue to, are willing to do that? Yes. The. Uh, in terms of a monetary fine, what's the condition of uh, Western? Um, what would I mean, a fine we're, do to we're, the we're, we're a small lab. Um, you know, we're basically just turning very small profits each year. Right? Um, good year for us would be forty thousand dollar profit would be a good year. So um, that that's it's not really our goal to be this hugely profitable company. So how many employees do you have? Sixteen. Down from twenty. Yeah, it varies. What was the largest number of employees you had? Um, probably around 25. And uh, the type of work you do, do you work for both private, commercial, public? Um, yes. All of those? All of the above. Do you have programs for students who can come and work in your laboratory? Yeah, we work closely with Cal Poly. What, uh, prior to this in, uh, matter, had you had any enforcement matters or any issues with ELAP? Um, no. So this is the first time yes. that you're aware of that Western has had an, an enforcement issue? Correct. Now, there were some comments made by ELAP in their analysis about your quality assurance document. How long has that quality assurance document been in place? As far as I know, since the beginning, it gets reviewed every year and ELAP reviews it every couple of years. Hasn't it been approved by ELAP? Yes. 2012, 2014, 2016? Yes. And before that, had ELAP ever had any complaints or issues with your quality assurance document? No. In terms of the um, third party audit, what is it that, which particular one have you suggested using? The uh, ISO 17025. Why is, why is that? Um, it's, it seems like something a company of our size could implement. And what's and, and it should, I, I almost believe that they suggested it at one point in time, but. Who is that? ELAP. They, you've heard the term TNI. Do you know what that is? Yes. What is that? Uh, the NELAC Institute. 
what, what is it what is it that t, what is it that ELAP wants you to do with regard to TNI? To implement TNI within one year. How, how would that affect your company? Uh, we would close down. Why is that? Well, just from estimates I've seen on what it costs to implement TNI would be substantial. It's what something we couldn't afford to do. Can you can you quantify the cost for you? Um, I've just seen numbers thrown around like seven hundred thousand dollars to to completely implement it. For a lab your size? Yeah. What what would you have to do? Come up with seven hundred thousand dollars to to implement TNI. Would you have oh. to hire more people? Oh yes. Yeah, so, well, yeah. From my, from my understanding, most of it's going to be um, additional staff, but it's. Certainly, the agencies aren't cheap. I think they're pretty substantial, too. I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. If I could just have a moment. Mr. Connie. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I have a couple of questions. They're a little bit out of order, perhaps. But um, with regard to your signature, you s testified today that you signed 16 of the reports. Is that correct? Correct. But your signature has been applied to thousands of these reports, right? Yes. So what does your signature mean? Um, you understand the question? Not completely. What does your signature at the bottom of your laboratory report signify? Well, Jeff, the ones I physically signed would mean that I um, reviewed the data and approved the results. What is the purpose of having your signature at the bottom of the other reports then? It should be the same thing. Is that an indication to your clients that that data has been reviewed and is correct to the best of your knowledge? It sh yes. So in this instance, is when you've reported that Western's run standard method 9221B, clients could then rely that you ran that method. Is that right? Um, correct. But Western Analytical Laboratory didn't, in fact, even have the equipment for standard method 9221B, did they? As the client should have been aware. Okay, so on your signed laboratory reports, you indicate that you ran the method, but you didn't run the method. Is that right? Correct. So for thousands of reports, you indicated on your laboratory report that you ran the method, but you, in fact, did not run the method. Well, I didn't indicate. I indicated on 16 reports. The others were, were generated by my supervisors. Okay, so for 16 reports, you indicated that you ran the method, but, in fact, did not run the method. He testified that he signed 16 of those reports yeah. and said they're true. Yeah. So is that true? You didn't run the method, but you said that you did. Correct. No, I didn't say I, I didn't say we ran the method. Did you have the equipment in your lab to run standard method 9221B? No. Did you report the results for standard method 9221B? Yes. And you signed those reports indicating that they were true and correct to the best of your knowledge for at least 16 of them, but correct. electronically for thousands? Correct. Who paid you for those reports? Um, well, Skyline it was part of the, the $900. In fact, the reports indicate that Skyline was the customer, don't they? Witness like to look at one of the reports? Show one of the reports. Yes. Do, do we have one of the reports? <clears throat> I'm going to present the report from slide 29. Mm -hmm. So I've shown you the exhibit from slide 29. It's a Western Analytical Laboratory report. Is that correct? Correct. And who does it indicate the customer is? Skyline Ranch. Does it have your signature at the bottom? Yes, it does. Do you know if that's one of the ones you signed personally or electronically? When I signed personally.
Um, you testified about your willingness to undergo a third party audit. Have you done so? No, we haven't. What prevented you from doing so before this hearing? The insistence that we do TNI. But, and who has insisted that you do TNI? Lap. At what time? Um, I pretty much the entire time. Okay. So you had proposed a third party audit as an alternative to TNI, but you haven't undergone that. Well, you weren't, you, you, you wouldn't accept that. Is that a step that you could have taken before this hearing? Um, possibly, but um, this whole trial and lawyers have cost us a lot of money. So I don't know if we'd be in a, in a financial situation where we can even afford that. So maybe it's not really a step that you could take. Well, we argumentative. Noted. Withdrawn. Do you have any other questions? I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Conti, you offered to implement a third party audit, correct? Once this ELAP situation became, you became aware of it, correct? Correct. But ELAP kept threatening to shut you down, isn't that correct? Correct. So you had very little opportunity to try to implement anything, is that correct? Correct, yeah, we've been surviving two months at a time with interim <laughs> certificates. Except for the last one, I think it was like four or five months. But for their request to do TNI, you might have been able to implement something, correct? Correct. But now you're facing a shutdown. Correct. Now, with respect to the questions about uh, the Western Analytical uh, uh, reports, Western Analytical did not perform these analyses under SM9221B, correct? Correct. Were prepared, the analysis was done by Mr. LaBelle and his folks, or the folks under his direction at Skyline, correct? Correct. And Mr. LaBelle asked you to prepare these documents, correct? Correct. And you did, it was your understanding, or did you understand that these documents were going to be used for regulatory purposes? No, I didn't. Did you understand that they were going to be submitted to the regional board as part of their reports? No. When did you first learn that was the case? In around April of 2018. Just briefly, um, do you still have the Exhibit 29? Yes. Uh, in the, I think it's a, the line below sample point, that says permit number, correct? Correct. And that references the permit that these results were used for. Is that right? Correct. Nothing further. Yeah. Right. With respect to that permit, why is the permit on the on these reports? I'm assuming Dr. LaBelle requested it to be on there. And is that standard? Is that just automatic on all your reports? Um, it, it depends on the client. So you didn't put this on there, did you? The no, I number? didn't. The template already existed for these reports. Thank you. One, one question. Are you responsible for the data reports that come out of your lab? Yes. Nothing further. Thank you. We have no other further questions of Mr. Conti. Okay, I think we have a few. If you give us a moment, we can. Mr. Conti, I'm still trying to understand the arrangement um, here between Western, EnviroTreat, and Skyline. So I guess a question I feel like maybe hasn't been clearly answered for me is, is there or has there ever at any point been any sort of written agreement between Western Analytical 
and either Enviro Retreat or Skyline? Not that I'm aware of, not that I could find. Mr. Conte, I'm going to have a few questions for you. Um, so, uh, and it, they may not be in order of, um, in a timeline, but let's start with, you're currently not accredited for SM9221. Correct. Right? Was your laboratory ever accredited for that method? Maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. Okay. I don't have any certs to go back that far. Okay. Um, it was stated that Mr. Zimmer was the one that did the initial training, correct? Correct. Uh, was what was his capacity in the in the organization? Oh, he was one of the owners and president. Um, and then uh, was he the, ever the lab director or somebody that was? Um, he basically the act, acted as as the lab director. He oversaw the environmental department and reporting and client relations. Okay, and and you don't know if he had knowledge of, of that method? No, as far as, what do you mean is? Of SM9221? Oh, he, he must have had some knowledge. He trained them on how to do it. Okay, and could you explain um, these calculations? It, it says you're accurately calculated? Yeah, you'd look at the number of positives and refer to a table in standard methods, and it would give you the MPN for the sample. So there's a calculation involved? Um, no, it's just more referring to a table than anything. So could Skyline had looked at the table? I mean... Certainly. But yet they asked you to do it instead? Um, yeah, that, for that, I, I'm not quite sure why. I, I'll, um, EnviroTree wanted a monthly summary of date of reports. Maybe Skyline wasn't capable of doing that. I don't know. Did anything about the situation seem strange to you? Um, in retrospect, certainly. Um, but uh, EnviroTree used to have a lot of um, unusual testing and requests. So, I mean, not, I wasn't that surprised by, by it. What other sort of unusual testing requests? You would just have, like, um, unusual tests like packs and chlorine breakpoints, things like that, that he would request us to do. So, were you doing? Um, I, I really can't explain that because I really didn't have any, any part of it. So, were you doing um, other t uh, testing or other analysis for Skyline? Yes. And that was under part of the accredited work. Correct. Right? Do you do any other type of non-accredited work like you're, like you did for Skyline? Nothing quite like that, but we do do unaccredited work. Um, about probably ten percent of our business is unaccredited work. It's different departments and so forth. Any other coliform testing that's non-accredited? Um, yes. We, we we have clients that, um, for instance, in the metal finishing industry, they test for. Um, coliform and, and play count in their water supplies and different plating tanks because um, you can get bacteria growing in them, which will adversely affect it. And that's not something ELAP would be accrediting for. I mean, we're accredited for the test, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't fall under their accreditation. Okay. I'm going to follow up with that. Um, you stated that you provided these monthly reports and that the total coliform is used for internal purposes? That's what I believed. So what, what would that purpose be in your mind? I, I don't run a wastewater treatment plant. I'm not going to pretend to you, know what, what testing they would want to do. So for regulatory work, total coliform has to be reported within a certain time frame, correct? Yeah, it has to be analyzed within a certain Analyzed? Yeah, it's being analyzed. a certain time frame? Correct. Okay. Um, what about reported? Um, that, that, would, that would be in the permit if it stated what, what, what time they had it. So do you think that um, monthly total coliform data would be useful for a wastewater treatment facility? I didn't think it would be used for, for what it was being used for. I'm just looking at the report, it did. 
does not appear to be an accredited report to me. So, so it's a month's summary of field, field data. Uh, I'm sorry, what, what would... something I could even th thought would be mistaken for being accredited. So. Could, could you expand on that? What, what would make it appear to be an accredited report? Well, like all the information that they were saying is missing on it would be on there. You know, analyst and, and times completed and time analyzed, all those things would be on there. So all of the other reports that you did do for Skyline, ultimately, uh, well, that were accredited, they would have all that information? We didn't do other coliform testing for them. So. No, non-coliform yeah, yeah, testing. Yeah, correct. Quick, quick question, one more. Um, is, are there other um, clients that you have where they send you raw data and you um, There are virtually every day we, get, we receive samples that have raw data on it, field data um, that the clients do. So, I mean, this is something that happens daily. Support that? Correct, and it's, it's flagged, mostly as a result of all this, but it's flagged as a field result by the customer, so. When you were talking about an audit, are you um, and Mr. Oaxaca referring to the same type of audit? He's talking about a data audit. Is that what you're referring to? Um, well, in which time was I speaking about the audit? We were, um, we're talking about TNI or? No, when they were talking about doing a third party audit. Oh, okay, yes. So you guys are both talking about a data audit? Yes and not more of an on-site um, assessment. I would assume there might be that involved in it as well. Do you get any estimates of cost for the data audit? No, I, I, would, I don't even know who to do it through. So I'm assuming if we're gonna go down that route, they could suggest people who do it, but that, that names were never introduced, companies that performed that, so. Thank you. Did you get any estimates of cost for, but it would be to implement ISO 17025? Um, like maybe in the thirty to $50,000 range. But that was just an estimate. There wasn't any official quotes or, or anything like that. Uh, one one question here, Mr. Conti. Um, so, this situation, your your corrective actions um, that were listed, um, do you believe that that would prevent misunderstandings for in future? Yes. Can you explain? Um, well, the reports would be made more more clear. For one thing, our ELAP accreditation number has been removed from our reports, and the, the you know saying that we're ELAP accredited at the bottom has been removed. And for tests that we're not accredited in or they're non-regulatory, those are flagged as such, so they couldn't be misinterpreted or misused. Are you asking your clients that you're doing non-regulatory work for if what the purpose of the reports are? Yes. And if it's non-regulatory, yeah. Is that part of a standard operating procedure in your quality management system? No. What about the ethics training that was mentioned? Do you think that's something? It's something that could be implemented. No, yeah, I wouldn't object. Out of curiosity, where did the seven hundred thousand dollar estimate come from? Um, I've just seen, you know, there's discussions online, obviously, about you know, there's a lot of chatter about, you know, 
you'll have going to TNI and what the costs are going to be. And I think there are some municipalities that have estimated what it would cost, and that number was thrown out there. Are you familiar with ISO 17025? Only vaguely. So you voluntarily are willing to go through, as you've explained, um, uh, an accreditation to ISO or compliance with that. Um, do, you, do you think that 17025 would have prevented this um, misunderstanding? Um, was implemented within your laboratory? Well, it would certainly, let, yeah, let, I mean, make the employees aware that this shouldn't be going on, so, something like this. So everything has to be accounted, accounted, for, accounted for. I don't know quite, think, well, quite how to prevent that. With the, I mean, the president of the company was the one who set it up, so. You know, the, the lab personnel never saw it. Never did, the samples didn't go through the lab, so it wasn't anything that, that was actually going through there. But have you so, thought of? But, but it would, it, basically it has someone else accountable other than the, the, the lab owner or the president, which is what the main thing it's supposed to, to solve, so. So in other words, someone other than me would be reviewing reports, so, and making sure the data was valid. So are there any other actions that you've implemented to avoid this type of situation? I think you. I mean, this is, the, uh, you know, definitely an oddity for, for what we do. I mean, there's no other situations like this. So, um, yeah, I mean, that would be about it. But we've just been hanging on two months at a time. So um, it's just kind of hard to implement, you know, all, all these other things when you don't even know where you're going to be in a month. I understand. Yeah, that, that's it for our questions. Can I ask one follow-up, please? After you heard about this ELAP situation, what did you understand Dr. LaBelle needed this data for? Yeah, I just thought it was for like internal quality, quality assurance. For what? For just process control maintaining the process of his system. I'm assuming he's the one who designed the, what, the system. I don't know. But would that make sense to have process control a month after the fact? Well, he was just maintaining records of it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carter, would you like to offer exhibits and evidence this time. Can I just uh, ask a couple questions based on the questions from the state board? Uh, you asked a question about a written agreement that there was indicating there was no, oh, I'm sorry, were you gonna allow that? Proceed, yes, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, just the, it counts towards their time. So just real quickly, um, you'd indicated there was no written agreement between um, Skyline and Western Analytical Laboratory, but you sent invoices to Skyline, is that right? Correct. For payment? Yes. Could that constitute a written agreement? Uh, objection noted. You can answer. I wouldn't see how payment was any sort of, of a contract. The, the other brief point was that you'd indicated that um, perhaps ISO 17025 would allow employees to prevent this kind of thing from happening in the past, but as the laboratory director and the signatory of the reports, you're actually responsible for preventing this from happening, right? Correct. Nothing further. Thank you. Um, would you like to offer exhibits and evidence at this time? On behalf of Western, we would move um, all of Western's exhibits based on the uh, declarations, the A through V, as in Victor. We'd ask that those be admitted into evidence. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, at this time, uh, we'll move to the uh, rebuttal uh, testimony uh, portion of this hearing. Uh, so prosecution team and Mr. Carter, do either of you have any rebuttal testimony to present? Uh, I do briefly with Dr. LeBeau. Okay, please proceed. Dr. LeBeau, could you please come please to the come lectern? Out, Dr. Dr. LeBell, was it your under oh, there he went. <laughs> Dr. LeBell, was it your understanding that uh, Western Analytical Laboratories was accredited for the me standard method 9221B? Okay, and what was that based on? I just worked with them. The microphone's not on. Sorry, your microphone's not on. If you could repeat your answers. No, no not yet. Maybe. Okay, was it your understanding that Western Analytical Laboratories was accredited for standard method 9221B? Yeah, my understanding was they were accredited for whatever they were submitting. Okay, and what was, and what was that based on? It was based on the assumption. They didn't tell me they weren't. So, um, I, I mean, it's been a long time, but that was my understanding. So it was your expectation if this data wasn't to be used for regulatory purposes, they wouldn't submit it to you in that fashion? Well, it was known that it would be used for regulatory submission. This was part of our permit, and that's, what, what, that's why the satellite lab was set up, was for that purpose, because it needs to be a daily sample tested. That was the reason. So it was known that that would now, to uh, Mr. Conti's, uh, at least I can say that he may not have been updated on this, and you know that was something internal. I'm not sure if he was aware of it and when he was aware of it, but this was the understanding from the start. But Mr. Conti was the one communicating with you about the submission of these data reports on a regular basis, correct? Uh, at a certain time, it was mostly uh, Doug Knight was the one that was uh, that was sending me the reports. But Mr. Conti was a signatory. Yes, I believe. And you guys exchanged emails about submitting these reports? We exchanged, yeah, we, yeah, I received email with the reports. I, uh, you know, if I didn't receive them on time when I was preparing it, I would let them know that I need the reports to be submitted. That, that was it. I have nothing further. Okay. Dr. LaBelle, uh, are you saying that you committed lab fraud? No. Why did uh, I say that? Do you know that the the analyses for total coliform was being were were being uh, performed by Skyline, correct? Or Western Analytical. This was the the point, and that's or for who made or Western Analytical. This was a satellite lab. That was the the setup from Western between Western and Skyline. Who told you that? Who, what do you mean, who, who told me that? Who set that arrangement up? Joe Zimmer. You know, did Joe Mears set Conte, it up. Did Mr. Conti set didn't. No, up? Mr. Conti was not, it was not there. He was not involved did in that. Did you time. have any conversations with Mr. Conti about this so-called satellite lab that was set up between not, you and Not until, uh, until about when, when the uh, inspection report came about. So after uh, your, after the regional board, did the inspection at Skyline. You called up Mr. Conti and told him about this satellite lab. Is that yes, right? Yes, I would. Uh, I made him aware because we received an inspection report that said that these were not supposed to be, and that there was some issues with them. And so this satellite lab that you claim was set up by Western, how many Western employees were at this satellite lab? We already said there were no employees. Right. It was set up as as we discussed. Did, did Western fund that lab? Did they spend yes. money? How did they do it? They, they provided all the equipment, the incubator, the test tubes, the, all the apparatus that was used. And that was in 2008? Yes, but right. ever since then, they sent all the, the And you replaced tubes. no more equipment? No. All right. And the media, did you supervise the Skyline's staff in using the media? No. Who did? They were following the directions. From who? From the, there was a book, a book that was prepared by Mr. Zimmer that described how to do the test. And when did Mr. That's Zimmer so leave Western? I, I'm not sure. I mean, it's been, uh, I don't know, uh, 
Mr. Conte would know. About 2015? I, I think before then. All right, so 2014 or 13? I, I don't know. So it may have been 2010, but, but I... Uh, and then after Mr. Uh, Zimmer left, who was training these people? Who was giving them guidance, if you, anybody? You're asking me a question about a lab that I did not operate. So uh, I, I don't have an answer for that. And that document that we saw, the report to the Water Board, who was performing the training for the Skyline staff? Okay, that, uh, just that you understand, that table has nothing to do with the coliform test. That table is training on operating the facility. And who? That was, it was for. So who would train these people at Skyline? In operating the facility? Of doing the test. They, they, this was again the training that, that Joe Zimmer started in 2008. One time. Right. I believe, I, I wasn't time. there enough to know if, uh, if anybody was there afterwards, but yeah, I believe that was the case. So one time in 2008, Mr. Zimmer came out to Sk Skyline, set up a lab yes. for Skyline, yeah, and then did some training, yes, and you never saw him again there again? I don't believe I saw him there again. And so every month after that, you would receive these reports from Western that said that the training, uh, the SM9221B was being performed under EL, uh, ELAP accreditation? No, the, the, I received a sheet of paper that had the results signed by Western, and that's what I submitted. And you believe that showed, even though Skyline's people were doing the test, uh, for, for Western didn't do any of the testing, correct? My, my understanding with Joe Zimmer, and that's what we believed, was that the lab was an extension, was a satellite lab of Western that was operating at Skyline Ranch. Did anyone at Skyline ever tell you that? Ever what? Did anyone at Skyline ever tell you, yeah, we're an auxiliary laboratory for Western? No, they were aware that they're working for Western. Who? Because Who said that? The, whoever was... was uh, doing the test. Were they paid guys. by Western? No. Well, how could they be working for Western? Well, uh, They work for free? No, they were working for the site, they were doing the test, and they were submitting it. That's uh, voluntarily. what the was. Voluntarily? Yeah, they're actually, there are retired people there. But they weren't employees of Western? No, they were not. That's And that's no one clear. at Western was giving them direction, correct? The directions were given in that booklet. There were SOPs that One time. were followed. One time. One time. SOPs did not change since then. I can tell you that. So between 2008 and 2018, when ELAP showed up at Skyline, you're saying those Skyline employees were working voluntarily at the direction of Western? They were working following the procedures that were given to complete those tests. They were following the procedures that okay. Mr. Zimmon had in a book that he yes. gave them in 2008. Right. It's not very complicated right. uh, procedures. Thank you. No more questions. Okay. Just briefly, uh, Dr. LaBelle, are you a qualified laboratory director? No. So you wouldn't supervise anyone in laboratory work, would you? Not at all. Nothing further. Dr. LaBelle, I did need to ask you the same question. Did you ever have any written agreement with um, Western Analytical Labs with regard to this arrangement? No, and I don't have with regard to, I, I do other work with them. I don't have uh, a written agreement. They are, uh, and they've done a very a good job over the years doing different projects, so, you know, got to give credit when it's due. So, yeah. But the, the, the written agreements are not very common, you know, working with laboratories. Thank you. So just to, to follow up, so what do you do for Skyline? I, I was the engineer who designed the plant. The plant was originally uh, just a package plant by the water district. We converted it to a sophisticated plant uh, and obtained the permit to recycle the water. So my, my training, my training is in design, uh, process engineering, 
of uh, wastewater plants of many kinds. That's what I've done over the years. So were you in charge of monitoring compliance of the plant? Yeah, I was, I was uh, submitting, preparing the reports. I mean, that's something that I do. Did Western Analytical, did you use Western Analytical to provide any other type of uh, process confirmation analyses other than the, besides call form? Uh, yes, they were doing the effluent testing at, uh, at Skyline since beginning of 2005 and maybe, maybe earlier because we ran the plant, ran the temporary package plant from 2004 and then we transitioned to the new plant. Uh, so they were, they were doing work for, for Skyline during that time doing, uh, you know, just the, the effluent compliance data is mainly like general and inorganic uh, testing. And, and are, are, they, are they still doing, are you, as, you know, up to a couple of year, years ago, were they still doing non-regulatory process confirmation type? And they, they were doing, okay, and there was also the test of the sludge in the system that is also regulatory, but it's, it's reported to the city of San Diego because the sludge is disposed to the city. So they were doing those as well. Right now, the lab that's doing the coliform test, which is in San Diego, is doing all the tests. I guess my, my question is, so all this data that was done during the startup, during the pilot phase, during any of the sludge, any ad additional analyses, anything provided from Western Analytical to you or to Skyline, was it all on the same type of form? Yes. With the same header and, okay, and same signature block? Um, I, I'm not sure if I heard your response correctly. So was there uh, other testing for non-regulatory purposes that um, Western was doing for you? Uh, there, were, there were sludge tests that were required by the city of San Diego. They were not so required. So that's regulatory, water... right. Yeah. But I mean, anything. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there were other regulatory tests that were done. Anything non-regulatory, anything? Uh, the, no, no, essentially not. Okay, because he had meant, uh, Mr. Conti had mentioned some other well he mentioned some tests that had to do with other projects not oh, okay. with skyline okay and there were some that were but we've done a lot of compliance testing okay no further questions from us we have no further questions for dr labelle and for our purposes i think we could release him for the afternoon he may have a plane to catch okay Thank you, Dr. LaBelle. Mr. Carter, do you have any uh, rebuttal testimonies at this point? No, you're, thank you. Okay, well, at this point, uh, can we do a time check, please? Can you let me know how much time is remaining for each party? Okay, thank you. So, so at this point, the parties may now present closing statements. The prosecution team has the amount of time that was just shared, and the West, Western Analytical has the time that was just shared, remaining for closing statements. So we'll start with the prosecution team and then move to Western Analytical. Yeah. I am Robert Brownwood, Assistant Deputy Director with the Division of Drinking Water, um, the technical operations branch of which ELAP is part of. And um, just have a few statements to make. And one of them is, is this hearing is a culmination of significant expenditure of resources. It started with a single call <clears throat> to the San Diego Water Board. And that call was a, a person who was concerned with, she had, had some health issues that she was concerned about. And was curious if that was a result of landscape irrigation from a recycled water facility and as you know, recycled water is treated wastewater used for irrigation. And that led to this investigation. And um, as you know, as you have had, as we've had, lots of questions as a result of this investigation. And actually some of them were answered today and appreciate that and grateful for those answers that we've gotten. Uh, the one question that I have, and I don't think we 
can have it answered at this point, point is, as the data that we've been looking at for 10 years, is it, is it um, do we have confidence that in that data that we can go back to this person who uh, made the initial concern about her health and go back to her and say, um, <clears throat> no worries with the recycled water. It's, the data shows that there's nothing wrong with it. We can't, we can't say that. Um, we don't have confidence in 10 years of data. Whose fault it is, that's, that's kind of what we're here to determine. That's what you get to determine. Um, <clears throat> but we know we can't have confidence in that data and we can't make that statement to this person. And that's a shame for, for the regional board and for the division of drinking water who's responsible for um, recycled water. Um, <clears throat> having said that, I do support our staff's findings and I do support their decision and I'm just grateful that we have this opportunity and trust in your judgment on this. Thank you. Um, I'll be briefer than I even anticipated because Mr. Brownwood's hard to follow, but um, I would just point out a couple of things with regard to uh, the evidence that's been presented today. Um, I think the most important statement an accredited environmental laboratory can make are the laboratory reports that they generate. They're the stock in trade for their lab and their validity is critical to public health and the regulators that rely on them. And I think that there's been a lot of discussion about whether Mr. Conti knew uh, what the reports are being used for and whether he um, was responsible for them even though he's a signatory of the reports. But I would assert to you that um, the most, the, to really understand what Mr. Conti knew you should look at his laboratory reports. The laboratory reports ultimately submitted to the, the San Diego Water Board signed verified statements. Uh, we heard from Mr. Conti today that the meaning of his signature means that this has been reviewed and verified and is true to the best of his knowledge. Um, he indicates a few things on those reports. On the report, uh, it indicates that they're an accredited lab, that the sample was run with standard method 9221B. Um, that the lab, rep the report was reviewed by Mr. Conti. Uh, it also indicates that the Skyline, uh, that the customers was Skyline Ranch Country Club and that it was for permit number R9-2005-0258 and the addendum. That's what they said in their reports for 10 years and for as long as Mr. Conti has been signing them. And so uh, if that's not a state, if that's not the true statement of the lab, then not only do we have concerns with the data integrity, I think we have some significant concerns with the integrity of the laboratory director. Um, that's a real problem. All of the data that comes out of that lab, he's responsible for, for its validity. And after the testimony we've heard today to hear, his signature essentially has no value. So how can ELAP have any confidence in the data that's arising from that lab? I think that we can't. I, I, I would just say, um, and to raise a point that Mr. Oaxaca had made earlier, Western Analytical had asserted that there was no data, no data fabrication, no falsification of data. But essentially, Mr. Conti, in his statements today, he has no reason to know that that's the case. That's the whole problem. They never got any quality control data with regard to the coliform results they're receiving. They he didn't observe the test happening. They were responsible for the data they're reporting on their reports, but they didn't take the steps to ensure that that data was generated in an appropriate manner. There's a complete dearth of knowledge about that, right? We have no chains of custody. We have no records with regard to where they took the sample. Um, it, he got a piece of paper. He transposed the information on that paper to another piece of paper, and then he submitted that to his client, which was then submitted as regulatory compliance data. I would assert to you that the laboratory director has significantly more responsibility in this instance to ensure that not only is his data um, of a known and documented quality, but also that it's, if it's being used in an appropriate manner, and if he's going to create a report that looks like it's for regulatory compliance, he knows that that's what it's for. And so I think to, to that extent, Mr. Conti is not credible. They did make some points about the 10-tube versus the 15-tube analysis and some of the more intricacies. 
of the standard method, but by Mr. Conti's own admission, they never ran the method, even though they reported it. They didn't have the equipment in their lab. The Skyline Ranch, if in fact it all happened, uh, didn't go according to the standard method. There's no quality control data. They didn't run the confirmation phase. And so ultimately what we're left with are um, many sheets of paper with the laboratory director's signature, signature on them that have no basis. I think based on just those facts and just that evidence that the actions ELAP took are appropriate and should be ratified by the board. Um, I said I'd be brief and so I'm going to. And so I would just submit the matter to the water board with those comments. Thank you, Mr. Knight. Mr. Carter. Thank you. Um, the first thing I want to mention is there was no harm in this matter. There's no evidence of any harm. I know Mr. Brownwood started with that. Uh, obviously, anytime there's a complaint, you take it seriously. There's absolutely no evidence that any harm was caused by what happened in this, what, what Skyline did, what Dr. LaBelle did or didn't do, or any of the reports by West. There's no evidence of that. In fact, it's put forth in Exhibit A. The email from ELAP says that. This is from May of 2019. ELAP does not have evidence that there is an immediate risk to public health based on Western's conduct. So we can put health issues aside. With respect to this shifting burden, what, what you have here is you have in the, in the citation and in the revocation and denial, the, the burden is knowledge. It's knowing. The statute says there must be knowing activity, knowing false statement, not eh, they should have known better, eh, they reasonably should have known. That's not the standard. Or you know what, maybe he should have done a better job. This is serious business. And if you want to put someone out of business, you don't do it on a negligent or maybe should have known. That's not it. ELAP has not proven their case that this was knowing. And I will defer to you as to who's credible here. You saw the testimony of Dr. LaBelle. Do you believe he doesn't know what was going on at Skyline for 10 years? One time, Mr. Zimmer came out, did some training, set up some things, never saw him again. And then the people at Skyline are using this booklet for 10 years, and that's supposed to be the auxiliary laboratory for Western? That is ridiculous. And that doesn't meet the standard. If you look at the definition of auxiliary lab, it doesn't meet the standard. Have to be five elements, not even close. In fact, even ELAP knows they can't meet the standard because in their own analysis they say it's a de facto lab. We're not even close to the standard. So I don't know what I saw here today. I certainly didn't see evidence. I saw a lot of conclusions and a lot of assumptions. And I think this is the problem. And if I could ask that our flow chart be shown, we submitted this as one of our points. I, I think all of this stems from a misunderstanding. You know, you've seen this really the first flow chart that that um, ELAP used was very had all these huge arrows going from Western over to Skyline. Today they used a very simple one, a little more nuanced. This, I believe, truly shows the relationship. Dr. LaBelle was running the show. Skyline was his client. He brought Western in, and you can certainly see all the direction that to Western went from Mr. Dr. LaBelle. All the direction and training to, Scott, to Skyline went from Dr. LaBelle to Country Club. There were two forms of communication that Western had with Skyline. They got the raw data sheets from the laboratory work that uh, Skyline was doing. It came into Western. 
Western would send Skyline the invoices to get paid for that $900 a month, of which they made about $100 profit. So this was not a money-making operation. This, there was no financial incentive to get involved in some kind of scheme. Now, whatever happened between Dr. Dr. LaBelle and Mr. Zimmer in 2008, that one time, it carried over. And here you have, you can certainly see the media and the tube vendor, that went right, right to Skyline from Dr. LaBelle. The only thing that Western did was they would send these col coliform reports that had the calculation, they would send them to Dr. LaBelle. Dr. LaBelle would work with Skyline to send those reports to the water board. And the water board communicated with Dr. LaBelle. They didn't communicate with Western. If Western was running the operation, don't you think the letters would have come from the regional board to Western and said, by the way, what's going on with your client? That's not what happened. <laughs> you, everything was communicating with the regional board and Skyline by Dr. LaBelle. And what's happened here, bec that misunderstanding, that wrong assumption has driven everything wrong in this case. And when I asked Mr. Oaxaca, did you ever interview anyone at Skyline? He has the authority to do that. ELAP has the authority <laughs> to do that. Didn't interview anyone at Skyline. Did you interview them to see if they actually did those tests? Or did you interview them to see who was really supervising you or training you? No, they didn't do it. Didn't do it. So here we are. And um, Western is fighting for its life because of those misunderstandings. And I think if you were to just look at one simple thing out of all of this evidence, you look at that flow chart and you can see it. And I think the evidence is gonna show from that based on the declarations, based on the exhibits, you're gonna see Skyline was Mr. Dr. LaBelle's client, not Western Analytical. Uh, there's no evidence that Mr. Conti or anyone from 2008 on made any representations to Mr. LaBelle or Dr. LaBelle or Skyline that they were accredited. There's, none, there's no evidence of that. No evidence of that. In fact, just the contrary. <laughs> Mr. The first time Dr. Uh, Mr. Conti heard about it was in early 2018 when Mr. Conti calls up, I mean, Mr. L Dr. LaBelle calls up Mr. Conti for the first time and says, oh, by the way, you know you're running an auxiliary lab. Mr. Conti says, no, we're not. That's not knowing behavior. That's shocked behavior. Now, whether or not the, the documents for, for Western could have been clear? clear? Yes, we'll, we'll confer. We will uh, concur with that. Could have been done better, but that's not knowing falsification or data fabrication. There's no evidence of that at all. In fact, ELAP made a big deal about the 10 versus the 15. In fact, in their, in their analysis, they said, see, because they were doing 10, they must be committing fraud. Well, they either didn't know there could be a 10-tube analysis or didn't want to tell you that because it, it led to a very negative impression. But that's not what happened. So we believe we've been able to provide you with the information to show no data fraud, no fabrication, certainly not by Western. Maybe they could have done a better job with the reporting. Maybe they could have done a better job of what is going on here. But it's not a knowing falsification. Uh, the other thing is just it, some basic, basic homework. All of the lab reports went from Western to Dr. LaBelle. None, zero went from Western to Sky, Skyline. There's no evidence, there's no emails, there's no faxes that show that. We, Western, provided you with the emails that clearly show you they're in Exhibit K. You can see the relationship. Western is sending their lab reports to Dr. LaBelle, nobody else. That, that clearly shows what the relationship is. And in terms of what, whether they were gonna be used for regulatory purposes, there's no evidence that Western knew they were gonna be submitted to the regional board for regulatory purposes. Western's not part of those reports. 
Western is not, there's no emails to that, there's no faxes to that effect, there's no witnesses that say, oh, I told them it was for regulatory purposes. It's not there. But I think the most disingenuous or misleading thing is in the ELAP analysis when they say, gee, if, if only, as bad as Western is, as they allege, as bad as it is, if they would only consider doing a third party independent audit, well, they didn't tell you that a year ago, Mr. Conti agreed to do that. I'll do it. But ELEP said, no, not good enough. Got to do TNI. TNI or nothing. Can't afford it. It's going to drive them out of business. But I heard Mr. Oaxaca say today, it doesn't have to be TNI. It could have been something less. If they had said that a year ago, we would not be here. It leads to the impression that the only reason we're here is to get twisted to do TNI. And I think that's a very bad perception. For 50 years, Wall, uh, Western has done a great job, no problems. And now here they are on the precipice of being driven out of business because of this situation, which you can see is not quite what you think it, not what they say it is. It's a little murkier, it's historic, it's not a knowing violation, but they wanna drive Western out of business. We don't think that's fair, and we hope you give Western a fair and objective review of the evidence, so that at least we could feel that we've had a fair hearing, and we believe we have. We appreciate it, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Carter. I will now take this matter under submission. We will prepare a proposed order for consideration by the full board. The participants in this hearing will be sent a copy of the proposed order and be given an opportunity for comment. The matter will then come before the full board at a regularly scheduled board meeting. And uh, we don't have a timeline set out for that yet, but we are targeting for early next year. Um, after the full board adopts the order, an aggrieved party would have 30 days within which to file a petition for writ of mandate with the Superior Court. I, I wanna thank everyone um, for your participation today, your cooperation in this hearing. I know this was the first one um, for ELAP, so it's, it's uh, you know, a new experience for many of us, but thank you um, for taking the time today, I appreciate it. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.